Hey students, we are looking at the force of friction today, and we're going to spend time on one specific force for two reasons. The first is it's a little tricky. There's actually two different types of friction, um, and some of it's not as intuitive as other things. Uh, the other big reason is because we will be using this force as we apply the second law to a whole host of future applications, so it's worth knowing the, uh, the basics. So let's just jump right ahead. The definition is fairly straightforward. We're only going to be talking about sliding objects. Nothing right now on wheels. Nothing that's rolling. We will actually analyze those objects in the second semester. But right here I have a box. And let's say the box is moving to the right at a speed of 3 meters per second. Well, friction, if there was friction present between the box and the surface, would be a force acting in the opposite direction. All right. If instead we change the direction, if we said the box was actually moving this way at 3 meters per second, then friction would actually reverse as well. That frictional force would suddenly change direction and start pointing this way. So the first thing is that friction is always opposing the direction an object is moving. Okay. That vector of friction is always acting parallel to the surface. So my surface here is a flat horizontal line, so friction would always be a parallel force. And you think of it as between those two things, the object, the blue box in this case, and the ground. Well, there are really two types of friction that we have to worry about. The first is known as kinetic friction, and that's for objects that are moving. The word kinetic implies motion. So when something is moving, when something is in the process of sliding across the surface, kinetic friction is the type of friction that's opposing the sliding motion of that object. Okay, the equation is the force of friction, and the specific type, it's kinetic friction. That's kind of a lot to write down, so it's sometimes written like this, this script F with a sub K. It's equal to lowercase Greek letter mu, and then the normal force, or the support force, on the object. The normal force is, you know, what we know. It's that force that any surface is applying upwards or perpendicular onto the object. Mu is something new. We have not gone over it before. But it's just a number. The fancy word is it is the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's a mouthful. It is always a decimal, and it's always a decimal that's larger than 1. It's always positive. I'm sorry, it's not larger than 1, it's larger than 0. All right, so it's always a positive number between 0 and 1. Okay, There's like no table of things you're expected to memorize. You're not expected to just know what these coefficients are. In any given problem, you would either be given the value, or it would be what you're asked to solve for. For example, a cardboard box sliding across a linoleum floor might have a coefficient of 0 0.3. If you took that cardboard box and then you were sliding it across concrete, it might jump to 0 0.8 because there's probably a little more friction. But again, you don't have to memorize these. Uh, it would either be given to you or, like I said, that's what you're trying to solve. Now, there's also friction when things aren't moving. And that's where static friction comes into play. If you imagine the table or the desk that you're sitting at, it's at rest. And if you gave it a very, very tiny little tap, it would stay at rest. Because there's a static friction, which is opposing the sliding motion of an object at rest. It's what prevents something from moving. The equation, though, looks very similar. Here I have my frictional force, little s because it's static. Okay, or F sub S, mu, times the normal force, very similar. The normal force is the same, and the Greek letter mu is very similar. It's the coefficient of static friction before it was kinetic. These will be two different numbers for the, uh, for the material. Okay? But if you want to get something moving, you have to overcome the static friction that is between, say, that desk and the carpet that the desk is sitting on. And that's where this equation comes from, which looks a bit more confusing than the one over here. This one's more or less straightforward. F equals mu times Fn. 
Here there's an inequality. The frictional force is less than or equal to. And that's because static friction is a little weird. Let's say the static friction on the table you're sitting at is equal to 100 newtons. I'm just making up a number. If you applied a pushing force right now that was 50 newtons, the table wouldn't move. The static friction would actually apply 50 newtons to counter that out. But let's say you're like, OK, I'm going to push a little harder. I'm now going to push with 80 newtons. I'm trying to get that table moving. Well, if you do that, you're still not overcoming that static friction. The total friction the table can endure is 100. So if you push with 80, the static friction goes to 80. That's where the inequality comes from. It's kind of building until it reaches some maximum value. And that maximum value is what you get when you have the coefficient times the normal force. To be honest, I don't really write this equation very often. I just write the equation like this equals mu s times the normal force. And just recognize that you have to overcome this value in order to start that object moving, in order to apply a net force on the object. So don't let that confuse you. If you write this on the AP test, no problem. You can get full points. Last couple things. Here's another inequality. And it's saying that the coefficient of static friction is larger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. And that simply means that for any given object on a surface, there's more static friction than there will be kinetic friction. The static friction on an object for a given surface is always larger than the kinetic friction of that same object on the same surface. That means the second bullet point. Okay, it's always more difficult to start something moving than when you are trying to keep it moving. And the example I like to give is imagine you're moving, like you're moving a couch across the room. You wouldn't do this. You wouldn't be like, OK, I'm going to give the couch a little shove, then stop. Then I'm going to give it another little shove, then stop. Then I'm going to give it another little shove. Each time you do that, you would have to overcome the static frictional force. So overcome static friction, stop. Overcome static friction, stop. Normally what people do when they're trying to move they get the object going, but then they want to keep it moving. And so yeah, they still have to combat kinetic friction, but it's usually easier than starting and stopping. So once you start an object going, you keep on pushing and sliding and turning, because it's easier than this very halting motion of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. Okay, Because again, static friction is always larger than the kinetic for a given object. Last, this is the equation on the AP test. This is a very broad equation, and it incorporates both types. Okay. Remember, kinetic friction is just Fk equals mu k times the normal force. For static, it's Fs equals mu s times the normal force. So they only wrote it once. All right. They expect you to know that there's two different types that you might have to keep into account. Again, they have this scary inequality, just so they're technically correct. I would just use this, use the equal signs. Okay, no sense in confusing yourself. All right, those are the key points of friction. We will see example problems with that in the next couple days' lessons. Thanks.